Uh, earlier today, we had a glimpse of the rising power of China, its stunning economic rise, not just by force of its awesome population, but by force of the rise of its entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, the theory as I learned it, the political theory as I learned it, is that uh, with the growth of wealth in a population through successful businesses independent of the state, there must sooner or later come challenges to the monopoly of the state as it is exercised by any one individual or party. And for that reason, China is criticized today for its domination by apparently a single party and democracy in our Western style is proposed as an appropriate answer. So the question is, does the West know best or does the East? And we're going to kick off this last session of Idea City with Daniel Bell. Hey, Daniel. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Moses and, and Kate. And as Moses just said, I am not a geek, um, which is in a way a bit of a problem because I don't feel very comfortable with new technologies. Um, I want to learn, but I find, and I agree with the first speaker that we should learn from the children and from our students and so on, but they're not always very patient with slow learners. So. The point is that I don't have any um, PPT or, uh, or videos. The only thing that I have, well, two things that I have, one, I guess I don't need this to facilitate the cheering for the ABBA or uh, concert, but the other thing I have, of course, is paper with, with lecture notes, and in, you have to imagine that this would be the second century BC when paper had just been invented in China, and then people would say, wow, so cool, much better than bamboo strips, you know? Um, so, so this is um, my kind of te technical aid uh, today. Um, but I guess I should say a little bit about myself. Now, I was born and bred in Montreal, um, and I've spent the past nine years teaching political theory in Beijing. And people often ask me, wow, you're such a, I mean, how, how could you deal with a cultural clash? I mean, Montreal is so different um, than China, but actually they're not that different because I'm from a very corrupt city and I work in a very corrupt country. <laughs> So, so there are clear um, parallels. Okay, so how much, I have 15 minutes to try to persuade you of an argument that had I heard it myself 25 years ago, to be frank, I would have been appalled, I would have, and I would have strongly, uh, you know, I, I would have disliked whoever is about to present this argument. Because really it does mean that we have to challenge the political intuitions that we learn uh, as children. And, um, I think with China's growing power, perhaps the argument is easier to make uh, than it would have been about 20 years ago. And the basic conclusion that I'm going to try to uh, arrive at, it sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive, because people often say, well, there's the standard trope is this about China, right? The past 20 or 30 years, there's been a lot of economic reform, but no political reform, right? I mean, you read any newspaper, that's the standard story. But I think the standard story is wrong. There has been political reform since the early 1990s. Not only that, but I think it's political reform on the basis of a desirable political model, and that political reform should continue to be based on that model. Now, what is that model? Well, that's what I'm going to try to explain here. Not just explain it, but try to um, justify it to a certain extent, and I'll end up with, some, um, with a discussion of a couple of problems that the model still needs to uh, overcome. Now, let me begin with a couple of uh, assumptions that I think should not be controversial. The first is the least controversial, that democracy is a good thing, right? I mean, we all think that we should have some say in our government, that we don't want to be governed. Nobody believes in, in these kind of godlike political figures, maybe like in North Korea, that we should blindly adhere to. I mean, that's a crazy idea. Of course, we, we should have some say in our political community, okay? Uh, nobody will disagree with that. The second assumption is not, it shouldn't be that controversial, but it sounds a bit controversial because it's not so familiar to us. And this is the idea that meritocracy or political meritocracy is a good thing. And this is the idea that the political system should be structured in a way that selects and promotes leaders based on superior ability and virtue. Now, that's, that's the standard 
you know, in Chinese political culture, that's more or less the mainstream view. And it sounds a bit strange, but it's not that strange. I mean, of course we want to be governed by political leaders with superior ability, right? I mean, political leaders, by definition, have power over us, and we want them to exercise that power in a rational way. I mean, if the political leader is stupid and ill-informed and, and makes wrong decisions, you know, then it negatively affects our interests. So, of course, we want leaders with ability to process uh, in complex information and be open to the world and have good understanding of the fa basic facts and so on. But we also want leaders who are virtuous in the sense that, at least in the minimal sense, that they're not corrupt, right? Leaders should serve the political community. They shouldn't serve their own interests. And if they're corrupt, then obviously they're not virtuous. So I think in this sense, we're all not just Democrats, but we're all meritocrats. We want leaders who, ha who have superior ability and virtue. The question is, how can we reconcile these two assumptions? You know, these two views that democracy is a good thing and meritocracy is a good thing. How can we reconcile them? And basically, there are three models that have been discussed. And uh, the first model is a kind of more democratic model. The second one uh, is one that I've been defending for 15 years or so, but I've now changed my mind. And the third model, I think, is the better model that I'll try to defend at the end. And it sounds like a defense of the current system in China, but I'll explain that it's not quite a defense. It actually points to the need for further reform according to that model. So what's the first way of reconciling democracy and meritocracy? The first is, well, let's just leave it according to the voters. The voters will choose whoever they think is the best, uh, most rational, and most virtuous ruler, right? No problem there. Of course, the problem is that, and there's a lot of empirical evidence now, voters are not always rational. I mean, there's this excellent book called The Myth of the Rational Voter, came out last year, by, or a couple of years ago, by Princeton University Press, by an economist. He shows in great detail how voters systematically misunderstand their basic economic interests. And he argues for that before you have the right to vote, you should, you should at least pass economic exams. <laughs> um, of course, it's a non-starter in a democracy, because once you institutionalize one person, one vote, you can't change a system. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, another problem with, uh, with the idea that we should select, uh, that we should just leave it to voters, is that voters often uh, vote in an immoral manner. If I vote, it's not just for, it doesn't just affect my own interests, it affects the interests of others, right? So therefore, I should, I should vote for people who, vote, who, who decide things according to the common good. The problem is that most voters vote according to their short-term economic interests. Again, they misunderstand those interests, but that's what they try to do. The only people who do, by the way, as a sideline, the only people who are more rational tend to be the richer capitalists, you know, which is why you have, you know, as a kind of, it's not completely unfair description of the American system. It's one dollar, one vote, rather than one person, one vote. But anyway, um, so, so voters should vote according to the common good, but they vote according to their short-term economic interests often, and that's immoral. Now, okay, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes voters do vote according to the common good. They vote according to the good of the voting community. Now, that sounds good, and that's when democracy works best, the voters vote according to the interests of the voting community. The problem now, especially in a big country like China or the US, is that the policies don't just affect the voting community, they affect non-voters as well. They affect future generations, they affect people living outside the country, they affect our ancestors, they affect animals in the natural world and so on, and nobody represents their interests. This is a serious, perhaps the deepest problem with democracy is that when there's a clash between the interests of voters and the interests of non-voters who are affected by the policies of government, like future generations, the interest of voters tends to dominate. And, if, and that's why dealing with climate change or global warming is going to be such a big issue, because you need politicians who have 20 or 50 year outlooks, and it's almost impossible in a democracy uh, to expect uh, politicians to have that long-term outlook, right? Because they're worried about the next election and so on. So how could we correct this problem? Well, we have had some ingenious proposals uh, in Western uh, history. You know, in the 19th century, the great liberal British theorist, John Stuart Mill, he says, let's give extra votes to educated people. Now, that, you know, the, it, to a certain extent, you know, that is not a terrible idea. The problem is that it's very hard to implement in practice. How do we draw the line between, you know, who, who, who's educated and who's not? And if you have a master's, you get two votes. If you have a PhD, you get three votes. It's impossible to draw the line in a non-arbitrary way. In other words, it's impossible to avoid controversy as soon as you bring up this issue. 
And the other thing is, once you implement one person, one vote, it's impossible to change. No matter how rational the argument, nobody's going to say, fine, I agree, I'm not as rational as other people, and I agree that other people should have extra votes. It's just a complete non-starter. So I think the idea of addressing uh, the problems of voting by giving extra votes to educated people or to any sort of group, in, for example, giving uh, exams in economics, is a non-starter. So what are the other models that we can have? You know, are there other models? I mean, you know, Winston Churchill famously said that, um, you know, democracy is the worst possible system except for all the others. And, and, that's, and that's so commonly used. You hear it all the time. I mean, I don't know, that quote must be one of the most commonly used arguments in favor of democracy. But in fact, there are other models. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And I don't know why he would even come up with that because, you know, Winston Churchill's, you know, main, uh, you know, enemy in, in, in World War II, of course, was, was the Nazi party, you know, and, and, you know, how were they chosen? I mean, you know, anyway. Um, so, the, okay, so what are the two other models? Okay, the first one is a horizontal model, meaning at the central level of government, you have, you have a democratic institution, one person, one vote to choose leaders, and you have a meritocratic institution where leaders are chosen on the basis of merit, superior ability, and virtue. And you've had great thinkers like Friedrich Hayek who proposed this bicameral legislature model. He says, let's have a bicameral legislature. It's different than the Senate in Canada, the House of Lords in the UK. These are, would be over people over 45 that have 15-year horizon and they have to think of the long-term issues, different than the uh, elected house. Com again, a complete non-starter because once you have a, a, a democratically elected house, that tends to be the only source of legitimacy in society. And whether it's the House of Lords in the UK or the Senate, not to mention these stronger upper houses that, uh, that Hayek had in mind, they inevitably are bound to lose power relative to the democratic house. What about in a Chinese context where there's more of a tradition of meritocracy? Well, the great Chinese uh, thinker in the early 20th century, Sun Yat-sen, he proposed an idea Let's give exams to politicians, not to voters. If the, we can vote for them, but if they fail the exams, then they can't serve the public. Now, that sounds like a good idea, and, and he's regarded as a founding father in both Taiwan and China. Again, the problem is that if somebody gets 80% of the vote and they fail the exam, you know, the system is bound to be unstable and to lack legitimacy. So that's another non-starter. Another great Chinese thinker, contemporary thinker called Jiang Qing, he proposes and several others, uh, Bai Tongdong and, and Joseph Chen and others. This is a common view and actually one that I've defended in uh, the past you know, 15 years or so. A democratic house where the, uh, the politicians would serve the interests of voters and a meritocratic house where the politicians are chosen by exams and performance at lower levels of government and they would serve the interests of non-voters affected by the policies of government, like future generations. The problem with that view is that Again, the democratic house, once it's there, it's bound to have more legitimacy and the meritocratic house is bound to lose some sort of power. Um, so, and that's one problem. You know, the other problem is that it's just unrealistic in China. I mean, we keep on hoping the past 15 years that it's moving towards that model, but it's not happening. So what's another model? Let's call this the vertical model, where we have meritocratically chosen politicians at the central level of government, or at the top, and democratically elected politicians at the bottom, with lots of room for experimentation in between. And that model is more or less a description of the model that has inspired political change since the 1990s in China. And I must confess, it seems so obvious in retrospect, you know, and I first learned about it when I met the current vice president, Liu Enchao, court with, with a few other academics, you know, and he, and he says, you know, why, is, why do Westerners, you know, well, okay, he, he, let, me, let, let me not attribute this, what I'm about to say to him, you know, but why is it that people, West people in the West think that there's one size fits all solution? At a little village, there's one way of choosing leaders. It should be the same way of choosing leaders in a country of 1.3 billion people. Of course, there's no one size fits all. We need different ways of choosing leaders at different levels of government. At the local level, people know the character of their leaders. They know whether they're corrupt, they know whether they're able. Um, they have a better sense of uh, the, lo the local issues are not so complex, whether you build a school or hospital, and if they make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You know. But at the central, and there's more of a community spirit at the local level, but at the central level, the issues are much more complex. If they make a mistake, it could be the end of the world, you know, whether to go to war, on climate change, I mean, these are huge issues, and the idea that 
expertise or experience doesn't matter at all. It's, it's crazy when you think about it, you know, but this is more or less the idea in a kind of one-size-fits-all model. So, so the basic idea is the further up you'd move the chain of political command, the more meritocracy should matter. In between the central level and the lower level, tons of room for experimentation, and that's more or less the Chinese model. You have cities, you know, Today we, we heard about Changsha, you know, which are doing fascinating experiments with architecture. You know, again, I met the mayor of Changsha. He's, he's again very fascinating. Uh, he has a PhD from, from Berkeley. Um, uh, he's worked in the World Bank and so on. I mean, compare that to mayors in Canada, and I won't name any. <laughs> any um, you know, so. So you have lots of room for experimentation in between, you know, um, and you have, you know, Hong Kong, of course, is a model of free speech. And the basic idea is the central government shouldn't intervene too much. Let all these experimentations happen, and if something works, then you can generalize it to the rest of the country. So, and more or less, you know, you think of China as a highly centralized state. In fact, it's highly decentralized. And you have all these experiments in all different cities and regions in China, much more flexibility than a very rigid federal system. And the leaders are trained for 20 or 30 years before they can move up the, the chain of command, you know? So they don't make beginner's mistakes. I mean, Obama, he's very brilliant, but when he was first made you know, president, he didn't have as much experience. Lots of beginner's mistakes. It doesn't happen um, in China. And note that this model is incompatible with competitive elections at the highest levels, because once you have competitive elections, you, know, you won't have this incentive to train people for 20 or 30 years. So it's a pretty good model. Now, what are the two flaws? And I have a minute and 40 seconds left to explain. Um, the first flaw, of course, is corruption, right? That the system is very corrupt. Everybody knows that. In fact, compared to countries at similar levels of economic development, it's not that corrupt. But there's more of an incentive to deal with corruption in China because of the fact that the leaders get legitimacy from being viewed as meritocrats, not from being viewed as democrats. So in fact, the government now, I think, is moving more or less towards dealing with corruption. I expect China to deal better with corruption than Montreal over the next decade or so. But anyway. The second problem is perhaps an even deeper problem, which is a legitimacy problem, that as society modernizes, and here I do think that it's also the case in China, there's more of a desire for political participation and open society. There are different sources of legitimacy. There's nationalism, um, there's performance legitimacy, you know, if you, if you alleviate poverty. But at some point, there's going to be a need for the people to endorse a system in China. And competitive election is a non-starter, so what could it be? Well, I predict that in 10 or 15 years, maybe 20, there's going to be some sort of referendum to ask the people, do you endorse the Chinese model? And if so, we're going to let, keep it in place in a more stable constitutional foundation for 50 years or so. If there's a strong yes vote, I think it'll be much more legitimate in China, and it'll have also greater respect abroad. So, so again, I'm not defending the system. I do think the system is, is, is more or less on the right track, but that it needs a tremendous amount of improvement. Thank you. I have 14 seconds left. <laughs> well done, Daniel. Thank you. What took you out there in the first place? Well, she's sitting China. up there. Ah, huh? <laughs> okay. My wife is Chinese. We met in 1989. The perfect explanation. Let's take a picture. Is Jean here? Jean. Yes. Up. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Let's get that picture. That's right. We have a five-year plan to fulfill yes. here. I had 14 seconds. I'd like to get up. <laughs> Thanks so much.